There are four vital elements needed for life. Number one is oxygen, number two is water, number three is sodium, and number four is potassium. The last three we're gonna be looking at later in our series, but today I wanna to look at oxygen. Let's have a look at the effect of oxygen in the human body. Yesterday, I took you to the cell. I showed you how glucose goes into the cell. Glucose goes into the cell under the action of insulin. Insulin is like the key that unlocks the door to allow glucose into the cell. So glucose comes into the cell, it goes through a 20 step pathway. This 20 step pathway delivers to us two units of the big E energy. The end result of that 20 step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because this eight step pathway delivers to us 36 units of energy. Whoa, and isn't that what everyone wants today? Energy. As I showed you yesterday, this pathway gives us 36 units of energy because it's an aerobic pathway, meaning it uses oxygen. So this is the aerobic pathway. Whereas the 20 step pathway, it's called an anaerobic pathway because it produces energy without oxygen by the, by the process of fermentation. What a difference oxygen makes. The most powerful way to oxygenate the body is exercise. Such an important subject that I'm going to devote another lecture to exercise. But today I want to look at all the other things that influence oxygen going into our body. First of all, let's make a list of the effects of oxygen on the body. Oxygen vitalizes. Oxygen invigorates. And you can see right, you can see why when you have a look at these pathways. An incredible difference oxygen makes. Oxygen electrifies. That's how you're gonna feel when every cell in your body is running on oxygen. Oxygen does something else too. Oxygen soothes the nerves. And we need nerve soothers. If you could put it into a bottle, you'd make a fortune, wouldn't you? And there is a name given for lack of oxygen in the body. It's called chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome has one cause, and that is lack of oxygen. Now there may be a hundred causes for that lack of oxygen, and some of those we're gonna have a look at today. So this is what oxygen does, and you can see why when you look at the energy cycles in the cell. 36 units of energy. But what are the, what are the symptoms of lack of oxygen? Medicine calls it hypoxia. Hypoxia basically means lack of oxygen. Fatigue. The person feels like they've climbed a mountain and all they've done is got out of bed. Lethargy, can't even get out of bed. Nausea, not the only cause of nausea, but it is one of the symptoms of hypoxia. Headache, not the only causes of a headache, but it is one of the symptoms of hypoxia. The most severe signs of hypoxia are blue top lip, blue fingertip. You see, when blood goes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen like a little parcel, and it gives the blood a bright red color. So when the person's lacking oxygen, their blood has actually a bluish color. That's the blue top lip, that's the blue fingertips. I find that many people I meet today are drifting in the haze that lies between optimum health, they're not actually jumping out of their skin with energy, and sickness. They're not actually bedridden. 
They're in the middle. <sighs> how many people, when you ask them today, how are you? How many say, all right, uh, not too bad? What does not too bad mean? Not too good? How many people, when you ask them, how are you, say, fantastic? You'd almost go, what's, what's the matter with him? It's tr sad, isn't it? And age has got nothing to do with this. When I came close to my 50th year, I was shocked at how all my friends were going, oh no, 50. Mm -mm -mm. Age has got nothing to do with this. We should feel fantastic every day of our life. And you can see from what I showed you in the cell, one of the reasons is simply lack of oxygen. So let's have a look at the things that influence oxygen going into our body. One is the air that we're breathing. Have you heard of negative ions? Negative ions are electrically charged oxygen molecules. Where do you find negative ions? You'll find negative ions wherever you find moisture, movement, and air. You see, water droplets pass through the air, giving off negative ions. So where do we find water or moisture, movement, and air? The thunderstorm. So negative ions are found, and again, the negative ions is referring to the negative charge. Thunderstorms. You'll also find negative ions. Again, we're looking for moisture, movement and air. Waterfalls. You'll find negative ions by the sea. So the ocean waves are also creating negative ions. And I think we can all identify the smell in these areas. If we had earplugs in and eye patches on, we would know by the smell of the air. You'll also find negative ions in the pine forest. Negative ions are given off by trees, but the pine is far more. You just think about it, you've got probably 18 little needles of a pine tree compared to the leaf of one other tree. So you've got this massive surface area and every leaf is always giving off oxygen. Always a little bit of moisture. If you look in the early morning in the bush, you'll see mist rising up out of the gullies, given off from the trees. And you only have to have the slightest breath of wind, and because the pine needles are so light, you'll get a little movement, whereas the other trees are hardly moving at all. That explains why the pine forest has more negative ions in it than other forests. On the other hand, we've got positive ions. Positive ions have more carbon dioxide in their molecule than oxygen. So where do you find the positive ions? You'll find the positive ions before the thunderstorm. And what's the air like before the thunderstorm? Heavy. In fact, we often say to each other, I can feel a storm coming. The air is heavy. And often people can suffer from these symptoms before the thunderstorm. You'll also find positive ions in the city. What have you got in the city? A lot of people and they're all breathing out carbon dioxide. And some people are smoking. And it gives off another gas, carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is a dangerous gas for humans because carbon monoxide competes with oxygen on the red blood cell side. I'll show you. So here we have a red blood cell and when it picks up oxygen it's an unstable union. It's an unstable union so that it can be dropped again quickly in my toes, in my brain, in my pancreas. Whereas when carbon monoxide is breathed in it forms a very tight union inhibiting the uptake of oxygen at that cell. You'll also find carbon monoxide coming out of cars. So car fumes are giving off carbon monoxide. Often when I'm in the city early morning and I see people jogging on the side of the road, 
I wonder the value of their jog on the side of the road when they're breathing in a lot of carbon monoxide. You also find carbon monoxide wherever you find mould. Mould runs very well with no oxygen. It's called an anaerobic organism. And it explains why when someone has a yeast presence in their body, their cells are running up here. Well, not all their cells, of course, but some of their cells are, which is one of the reasons why they lack energy. That's the only energy that they're getting. So one has to be very cautious of any mould in the house or any mould in their work area. And it is one of the reasons for chronic fatigue syndrome. I had an, a lady come and see me. She was an engineer from Russia. She said to me, I was working in Australia for a couple of years and then she said, I got chronic fatigue syndrome. That always challenges me because you can't catch this one. <laughs> So again, I put the detective hat on. I listened to her story, first of all. She said, I went to the doctor and I told the doctor that I was living in an apartment on the southern side of the apartment building on the bottom floor. She said, I noticed that my leather shoes and my leather belts would often go moldy. And there were some cupboards and rooms that often had mold in them. I mentioned to, this, to the doctor, but he didn't seem to take note in what I was saying to him. She said, I had, to, I had to stop work. I just had no energy. She said, I was battling this for about a year and I heard of a doctor in Manly, Sydney, who, who specialises in chronic fatigue syndrome. She said, the first thing he asked me was, where do I live? I, ex I explained my house to him and he said, you cannot go back to that house. He said, you can't even set foot in that house. She looked at him. He said, maybe if you've, you, you're well covered and you've got masks on and not, no, as, no contact at all with any part of your skin. <sighs> See, common sense had told her that. Do you know there's been a death and no one attended the funeral because no one knew he died. It was the death of common sense. <laughs> I'm surprised, well not, not really, but I am surprised how many people I meet with chronic fatigue syndrome and I, I trace their history back and I find contact with mould. Most people are unaware, unaware of how dangerous exposure to mould is. You'll also find positive ions coming out of some heaters. Now the heaters that are the most dangerous are the heaters that rob the air of oxygen. Now we have in every house here at Misty Mountain wood fires. You might just see the edge of one just here. It's like a combustion stove. And we love them because it keeps our houses nice and warm. They do rob the air of oxygen. But what we do in the winter, say we have a program starting on Sunday, we light this fire Saturday morning and you'll notice that our building is big, thick, besser bricks. So by Sunday morning, it's toasty warm and we're able to close the vents. So now the heat is not robbing there of oxygen and yet that nicely maintains the heat. So if you do have one of these heaters in your home, just be mindful that they do rob the air of oxygen. As soon as you're able, bank it down, meaning close the air vents so the air's not being taken or the oxygen's not being taken out of the room. Always have a little bit of a window open. Have plants in the room. Plants, especially the wide leaves, are able to purify the air. The best heaters are probably your, uh, your oil heaters in those columns that are warmed up by electricity. So just be mindful of heaters in the home. You can do much to improve the oxygen content of your body by being mindful of the air that you're breathing. There's one thing else that you can be mindful of that will influence the oxygen uptake in your body and that is hydration. Let me tell you a story. I gave a, a lot, well I, I did a live blood analysis on a 23 year old girl one day and her blood was clumped, her red blood cells were clumped like that. I always presume I've spoiled the slide. It is very easy to spoil a slide. 
Five blood slides later, her blood looked like that. I said to her, have you had any water to drink today? It was, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. She said, I don't drink water. I said, I can tell. I said, I cannot read your blood. It is so clumped. Her mother came in. Her mother was 45. I took her mother's blood and it looked like this. I said to her, your mother is 22 years older than you and she has better blood than you. This girl did not want to be at our health retreat. Mind, mind you, by the end of the first day, she grabbed a book and a pen and started writing. She started to get excited about the information she was hearing and at the end of the week she said, I wish this was my first day. <laughs> Ten years later I talked to her mother and her mother said she's married with a little baby and she's applying everything she learned at Misty Mountain. <laughs> But when I did this blood slide, she, she was not drinking water, she was not interested. It's amazing the difference that knowledge makes, isn't it? Now when that blood goes through the lungs, how much oxygen is it picking up compared to when this blood goes through the lungs? Can you see the surface area that has been lost purely because of dehydration? One microbiologist said to me, he said, Barbara, we have done research on this. And he said, one cup of coffee requires five cups of water to accommodate for the dehydrating agents in the coffee. Whoa. How many people having coffee or tea instead of water? How many people do we meet today who are always tired? They may not have exposure to mold. They may not have problems with the heater. They could simply be dehydrated. That's easy fixed, isn't it? Now the good news is that this girl, if she started drinking water and the best way to hydrate the body is little by little by little over the day, by the end of the day, I could look at her blood and it could look like this. Dehydration is easy fixed. So a person can suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome simply because they're dehydrated. Another way that a person can limit the amount of oxygen going into their body is by the way they breathe. Our body was designed so that the abdominal muscles are used in the breathing process. I don't know if you're familiar with Andre Procelli. He's a blind Italian op singer, opera singer. Amazing voice. And I saw a, a video once of him in concert and he's standing like this. <laughs> you see, when you learn to sing, your teacher teaches you how to to breathe with your abdominal muscles because you cannot hold the note, you cannot get the tone. Obviously with Andre there's a little bit of training there but sometimes he'll sing a note and you think how can he go much further and he'll go up onto a higher note and go a little bit longer. Yes that is training but he has trained not only his chest and throat but mainly his abdominal muscles. So our abdominal muscles must be used in the breathing process. Many times that is not possible because of posture. So hunching like this, it's impossible to use your abdominal muscles. Tight clothes around the, the waist inhibits the abdominal muscles being able to breathe. So there are some of the things that can influence the oxygen uptake in our, in our blood. Our, our body was not only designed to use chest, but abdomen. And when someone is just a high chest breather, they can actually be losing out on gaseous exchange at the bottom of the lungs. So be very mindful of the way that you're breathing because that absolutely can influence the oxygen uptake in your body. And this is why I suggest that everyone do Pilates exercises. When I say Pilates, I mention Pilates because it's well acknowledged that those group of exercises are designed to strengthen the core. And the core of the body is like the hub of a wheel. And your core muscles in your abdomen 
are all connected to your spine. In fact, you have one muscle called transverse abdominis, and it starts at your spine, connects with your hip and your rib, hip and rib on other side, and then back to spine. And when you do core strengthening exercises, which Pilates targets, then when your muscles here are strengthened, it automatically pulls your spine straight. So part of your exercise program, ideally even five days a week, should be some core strengthening exercise that will help your spine to be stronger and straighter and then it will be easier to use your abdominal muscles in the breathing process.